Hello, and welcome to Wonders of a Watershed. My name is Megan Post, Water Quality Extension Agent in Washington County. This presentation is designed to virtually enhance the science curriculum of middle school and high school grade levels in Northwest Arkansas, but it's relevant to anybody looking to learn more about watersheds. Let's define it. What is a watershed? A watershed is an area of land that drains into a particular body of water. Normally, the watershed is named after the body of water that the land drains into. This is the fourth largest watershed in the world, the Mississippi River watershed. The boundaries of a watershed are called the watershed divide. This watershed extends from the Appalachian Mountains to the Rocky Mountains and then empties into the Gulf of Mexico. All watersheds have a subwatershed or a subbasin nestled within them. A subbasin of the Mississippi River watershed is the Arkansas River basin because the Arkansas River flows into the Mississippi River. Do you know what watershed you live in? You can check out mywaterway.epa.gov and find out. Here's the Arkansas River watershed, Illinois River watershed, and Beaver Lake watershed. There are numerous sub-watersheds within the six large river basins in Arkansas. Arkansas has nearly 90,000 miles of streams that drain into the six large river basins. So, what watershed do you live in? The Illinois River and Beaver Lake watersheds are designated priority watersheds by the Arkansas Natural Resource Commission. Now what that means is, a priority watershed program focuses on Priority watersheds where there are known impairments or significant threats to water quality from present and potential future activities. Why do you think the Illinois River watershed and Beaver Lake watershed are designated priority watersheds? The answer is because increased urban disturbances, which means increased runoff as a result of urban growth and land use changes. Scientists put pollution into two different categories. Point source pollution talks about pollution that is discharged from a clearly defined fixed point, such as a pipe, ditch, channel, or sewer. Can you think of examples of point source pollution in your county? Non-point source pollution refers to pollution that does not originate from a clearly defined fixed location. So we're talking about things like bacteria, nutrients, sediment, toxic and hazardous substances, and litter. Let's dive deeper into non-point source pollution. One example of non-point source pollution is bacteria. Now this comes from improper management of livestock, pet waste, faulty septic systems, and manure. This is also one of the easiest action items for you to pick up your pet's waste. Here's a shocking statistic that backs this up. A Gallup poll says that 44% of U.S. residents own dogs. Now Fayetteville sits at over 85,000 residents. Roughly 37,400 residents own dogs if we go off of that 44%. Now let's loosely estimate that each resident owns one dog. So the average dog waste produced from a Chihuahua to a Great Dane is a half a pound per day which translates to 18,700 pounds of pet waste per day or 6,825,500 pounds per year. Now imagine all of that getting washed into our creeks, rivers, lakes, and streams. Unfortunately, that's where a lot of it goes after a rainfall. So it's important to pick up your pet's waste. Livestock and pet waste contribute to excess nutrients in waterways. Algal blooms are a result of the overgrowth of algae or algae-like bacteria created by excess nutrients. Eutrophication occurs when the aquatic environment becomes enriched with nutrients. According to the Oxford Dictionary, eutrophication is the excessive richness of nutrients in a lake or other body of water, frequently due to runoff from the land, which causes a dense growth of plant life and death of animal life from lack of oxygen. Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus create these algal blooms, which increases the turbidity of water. Underwater plants suffer due to the darkened water, which can disrupt the food web. Besides being an eyesore, producing a foul smell, 
and the huge economic and environmental toll algae blooms cause, some blooms are harmful to human and animal health. Harmful algae blooms are blooms that produce toxins that can affect the liver, skin and mucous membranes, and disrupt neurological processes. According to the EPA, warmer water due to climate change might favor harmful algae. Warm and still water give HABs a competitive advantage and prevent water from mixing, allowing algae to grow thicker and faster. Sediment is the most prevalent pollutant in water systems in Arkansas and the United States. Sediment can get into lakes, rivers, creeks, and streams from erosion, flooding, construction zones, and runoff from agriculture fields. It carries bacteria, and sediment particles trap heat, which decreases dissolved oxygen in the waterway. Turbidity measures the amount of total suspended solids in the water. Increased sediment means increased turbidity, which means decreased dissolved oxygen. Toxic and hazardous substance refers to oil from spills, leaky cars, and illicit dumping of hazardous materials. Washing a car in the driveway seems like something that wouldn't have any effect, but the water and the soap that runs down the driveway into that storm drain system leads directly to a waterway. Here in northwest Arkansas, our storm drains do not get treated before they enter into a water body, so it's important to take your car to a car wash to get it clean, and if you can't do that, wash it in the grass. There are a lot of rules and regulations that companies must follow in regards to hazardous materials disposal, and there are guides for homeowners as well. And lastly, litter. Cigarette butts are the most abundant form of litter in Arkansas and on the planet. Filters are made of plastic and have been known to leach carcinogenic chemicals when disposed improperly. Plastic foam or polystyrene we produce enough in America to circle the earth more than 40 times, and that's just foam cups. Reducing our waste equates to reducing litter in our natural environment because it enters the natural environment intentionally and unintentionally. So the best thing we can do is turn off the spigot. Litter can become a serious problem to wildlife that can mistake it as food. Plastic doesn't really ever go away in an ecosystem. It just breaks down over time into microplastics. Microplastics are smaller than 5 millimeters in size and can bioaccumulate in the stomachs of animals that eat it. Not only can that cause serious harm to the animal itself, but the plastics leach chemicals that then leach into the flesh of that am animal. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be eating a fish that I caught with a belly full of plastics. There are five main functions of a watershed. One is water catchment. Two is water storage. Three is water release. Four, biogeochemical reactions, which is talking about the interactions between living things, the physical environments, and chemical processes that occur between the three. And five, plant and animal habitat. Before we build in a watershed, the ecosystem does a good job of taking care of itself and cleaning itself through the hydrologic cycle. When it rains, water gets filtered through through the plants and then evaporates back up into the atmosphere. Now, add humans into the mix and we have a, a slightly different um, look to our watersheds. We have increased impermeable surfaces, so more concrete areas, we have increased erosion from said increased concrete areas. We have agriculture and we have changed the landscape and water flow of certain parts of the water bodies. Healthy watersheds perform critical ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are natural processes that provide social, economic, or environmental benefits. So the question is, can we build with that in mind? And the answer is yes, but we'll get to that later. Can you think of any ecosystem services a watershed provides? Northwest Arkansas consists of karst topography, which allows groundwater to potentially become easily contaminated because water travels rapidly into underground aquifers where it can quickly become surface water again in some cases. Because of the karst landscape, Non-point source pollution prevention is even more important. Let's take a closer look at watersheds with our Enviroscape. 
And here it is. Let's name our watershed Beaver Lake. This large lake looks great for swimming, fishing, and kayaking. It's also the city's drinking water. In this watershed, we have a sewage treatment facility. We have behind that a golf course, also a suburban neighborhood with a construction site on the top left-hand corner. Bottom right-hand corner, we have a agricultural field with a farm with farm animals. Two types of pollution that you frequently see coming off of farm fields is pesticides and herbicides. Pesticides kill pests and herbicides kill unwanted invasive plants from your farm field. We talked about bacteria pollution before. Well, we have a problem with the cows on our farm because they're frequenting the creek. They're not fenced off and they're able to enter the creek anytime they want. So we're going to pour some fake bacteria by our cows that are in the creek and on the side of the creek and also our chickens. Do you see anywhere that soil would become eroded on our Enviroscape? Soil can become eroded right where it meets the water. It's highly likely that water will wash that directly into the, the lake, especially since there's no riparian buffer zone of vegetation, trees, or grass line to catch that sediment from eroding into the lake. All of the cars in our Enviroscape can leak, so we're going to go ahead and put some oil underneath them. That truck has a major issue. <laughs> Anywhere where there's exposed soil, it's open to erosion. So I'm sprinkling some soil anywhere that I see brown. We have a couple pets behind this house, so we're going to go ahead and sprinkle some bacteria. Some pet waste down right there. You'll see that it's going through the stormwater drain. Ooh, our lake is looking kind of rough. I'm going to go ahead and sprinkle some fertilizer onto these lawns. We like to make our lawns look nice and green, especially in times of drought. So I'm going to sprinkle some fertilizer on there. Back in the corner there by that construction site, I'm going to go ahead and sprinkle some soil. It looks like it could be open to erosion there. And also our tractor that can have a potential leak. Here I'm going to go ahead and sprinkle some soil where a hillside was deforested. It was improperly managed and they went ahead and clear cut a bunch of the forest exposing all the soil. So we have a bunch of soil exposed on that slope there. Now these sprinkles represent litter. Litter gets into the environment by directly throwing it in, into the environment. Sometimes it blows out of trash cans. Sometimes it blows out of vehicles. Sometimes litter gets into a water system by flooding from a yard. Well, we're going to go ahead and rain on our Enviroscape and show how some of these pollutants get into our water. There is the stormwater drain that's leading directly to the creek, which leads directly to our drinking water source. And now we can start to see our litter accumulating into the lake as well. So to go over all of the sources of pollution that we put onto our Enviroscape, we had toxic and hazardous substances from oil leaks in cars. We also had nutrients. We had phosphates and nitrates from the agriculture field, the fertilizers from the homes and the golf courses. We have sediment from erosion that came from a lack of vegetated area next to a creek or a lake. Also, we have litter that was also sprinkled around the Enviroscape. We also have bacteria from pet waste and agriculture improperly managed livestock. Does this look like a lake that you'd want to drink from, let alone recreate on? Let's start brainstorming ways that we can help prevent our lakes from looking this way. What are some things that we can do on a daily basis to help prevent this problem? Maybe in our houses, at our schools, in the agriculture fields that we tend to. Brainstorm some solutions with your class. 
Now that you had an opportunity to see firsthand how pollution makes its way into our waterways, let's talk about how we can fix it. Best management practices are land management strategies that prevent or reduce the movement of sediment, nutrients, pesticides, and other pollutants from the land to surface or groundwater. You'll see in this picture, this pet owner is picking up its pet waste. That's one best management practice you can do. The picture on the top left represents a riparian buffer zone. These buffer strips can be located between a farm field and a water source. And what they do is they help catch the nutrients and sediment that may come from the farm as runoff and collect it. So they store water and they filter it out. Land conservation is important. The picture on the top right in blue is a chunk of land called Blackburn Bluffs. The Northwest Arkansas Land Trust recently purchased this chunk of land to act as a wildlife corridor in between Devil's Den State Park and Rotten Bluff Hollow. This land will forever be conserved and be able to be enjoyed by the public. The pictures below are examples of best management practices that farmers can implement on agricultural fields. While the list is not exhaustive, there are a ton of examples that we won't get into, but ones that I want to highlight are critical area plantings. So the before and after photo there, it shows an area of land that obviously gets hit with a lot of water. So they went ahead and they planted some grass to help hold in that soil. BMPs are tools that farmers can use to reduce soil and fertilizer runoff, properly manage waste, and protect water on, and air quality on their properties. These BMPs help them achieve multiple positive environmental outcomes and also increased yields. There are a lot of BMPs that farmers can implement, but a few examples are cover crops, conservation tillage, crop residue maintenance, crop and livestock rotation, and heavy use area protection. A riparian buffer zone is also acting as a wildlife habitat enhancement area. Wildlife is able to thrive in that little patch that is left. Another tool that we can utilize is low impact development. LIDs are methods and techniques that are used to slow down, spread out, and soak in stormwater on site. This is a picture of a bioswale at Beaver Water District office. It does a great job of imitating a wetland. One example that a homeowner can implement is redirecting downspouts from into a storm drain management system and onto the property directly to help soak it in. Now this homeowner also added rocks that help eradicate erosion problems that can occur. The picture on the top right is a mini bioswale that helps slow down, spread out, and soak in runoff. Under that are examples of a rooftop garden, a rain garden, and a rain barrel. The bottom left picture is a permeable paver. This is an alternative to a traditional driveway in that water can actually permeate through the bricks and the grass. What can you do at home to help prevent non-point source pollution? Number one is reduce your waste. Waste. Reduce the amount of things that you purchase. Take every thing you purchase as a vote. So you're casting a vote to tell that company you want to see more of it. If you don't buy it in the first place, you don't have to reuse it and you don't have to recycle it. Pick up litter and pet waste when you see it. Don't litter in the first place. Cigarette butts are the most prevalent form of litter around the globe. And those filters are made of plastic fibers. Not only that, but that filter is holding a lot of chemicals that are actually uh, carcinogenic to animals, thus us. Volunteer with local conservation organizations in your area. Everybody needs help. And if you're of driving age, Make sure you're staying up to date on your automobile's maintenance. Recognize leaks when they're occurring and get those fixed. Wash your car at a proper car wash facility. That water that comes off of that car wash facility is treated. Whereas washing your car in the driveway, all that water and soap might go down into a storm drain and you might be polluting a nearby waterway. Lastly, share your knowledge with people, your friends and your family. Every little bit helps. Thank you so much for being here. If you have any questions at all, you can contact me via email at mpost at uaex.edu. Take care.